Our gospel lesson this morning is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Thank you. 
Amen. I was watching Maria's face. She liked it too. <laughs> And so we read from a second gospel today in the Gospel of Luke, a very familiar story from the 10th chapter. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What, what do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think? was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers. He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. All thanks and praise be to God for this word. May it be an inspiration, a source of direction for our lives and how we conduct ourselves in this God's creation. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. So I wrote this sermon like I do every week, and, and, and yet when I was in early this morning, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking to myself, I know what I want to do, <laughs> I, know, I know where I want to go, and um, there's something missing here, I'm not sure. Um, and then I come into church and Pat Arner tells me that Bob Grunlier told her that he was here to hear a good sermon. I thought, oh, great. <laughs> something happened 20 minutes before worship today, and I want to share it with you. Um, Jack Mutzbaugh brought a man into my office. Um, I bumped into him, and he asked where the coffee urn was, and I told him, and he went, I guess, and got some coffee, but then, and I didn't know if I'd see him again or not, but Jack brought him into my office and sat down, uh, and we talked. Jack left, closed the door, um, and he was sitting there, kind of a big, strong guy, um, crying, and um, had a Marine Corps Veterans t-shirt on. And he told me that this morning, his son was in a, uh, three o'clock this morning, his son was in a motorcycle accident here in Fort Myers, um, serious injuries, and got airlifted to the hospital in Tampa. Um, And I was kind of, Remembering, I, I know what types of conversations these lead to. You know, I'm, I was expecting that he was needing to get to Tampa and was going to need some help, and I was ready and willing to do that. But it went a, dire- it went a direction I didn't anticipate at all. Um, he said, while he was crying, he said, what i got to know is this. Is God punishing me and is God punishing my son? 
because I killed people I didn't even know in the war over in Iraq. Whoa. And I said, no, that's not, that's not what God does. We are human. We are broken. And God understands that more than anything else. God knows that about us, and God is not in the revenge, punishment business. There may be some traditions out there that teach that. We don't. And the Bible doesn't either. God is with you. God is with your son. We all do things in this life that we can't control. Sometimes we're in a position like you were in where you had no choice. Other times we make choices. It doesn't matter. God loves us unconditionally. And that never changes. We talked a little more and then he went on his way to get to Tampa as soon as he could. I didn't like the lectionary passages this week, so I chose a couple of my own. And I decided, for whatever reason, to do a juxtaposition between Jesus' teaching to, in Matthew, uh, basically in the Sermon on the Mount, to love our enemies. And also in the story of the Good Samaritan, love our neighbor as ourself. Now, those two things are in two different Gospels set apart by their contexts in which they were given. And they're two vitally important teachings that Jesus bestows upon us. Now, which one do you gravitate to more easily? Love your enemies or love your neighbor as yourself. I think if we're all honest, we know that the direction we gravitate in is towards loving neighbor as ourselves. We know our neighbors. You know, when that lo young lawyer got up to test Jesus and Jesus asked him, well, what do, you, what do you think? And the man said to him, this scholar of the law said, shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? and your neighbor as yourself. Now, the first part of that, love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, that, that actually is well known, one of the most basic teachings of ancient Judaism. It's called the Shema. And the Shema was something that every young child had to memorize right from the beginning of learning who God was and who they were as a Jewish person in the world. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And so Jews grew up knowing that by heart. Now, what didn't go with that saying in the Shema was you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That, that's, that's found in a more obscure place in the 19th chapter of Leviticus. The only person we know that ever brought the two together and made the connection you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself was Jesus. Jesus connected the Shema, which was well known to everybody, and a somewhat obscure teaching from Leviticus. And as you know, Leviticus is full of all kinds of stuff. Um, and he put them together. But the other thing to remember is that the passage from Leviticus, when it says your neighbor, it meant literally your neighbor. And what does that mean? Your fellow, your fellow Jews, the people of your tribe. Love the people of your tribe the way you love yourself. 
That was the original context in which that was given. It didn't tell them to go love somebody who really wasn't their neighbor, who lived far away and you didn't get along with. It, that was not what it meant. But that is what it meant when Jesus linked it to the Shema. And then he's going on to tell a parable where the good Samaritan who comes and helps the fallen Jew is by no means considered a neighbor by any Jewish person. That was just the way it was. That was the context. There was conflict. The Samaritans were not good enough as a people, most especially in, re in regard to their faith. And so that is, you can turn my mic on, something's gone wrong here. So anyway, what happens is um, Jesus brings these two things together. But now, okay, as we struggle to find out what it means to love neighbor as ourselves, and neighbor may not necessarily mean someone from our tribe anymore, may mean different race, may mean different ethnicity, may mean a lot of things that say that this person is nothing like us, but we need to call them neighbor and we need to love them anyway. So, you know, that's enough to work through, okay? In our society today, most especially, that's a lot to work through. But now we've got to bring this together with a separate teaching from Jesus that basically tells us to love our enemies. And the question is, the deep abiding question, I mean the lawyer said, and who is my neighbor? But for us, there's another question we have to ask, and who is my enemy? And that opens Pandora's box, my friends. I mean, Jesus said, love your enemies, period. Now we have to figure out what that means. The man who was in my office this morning said he killed people he did not even know. He didn't say anything about their enemies and he was feeling pain in my presence as a result of that. Yes, we know that that's, that that's the way of the world. It is the way of the world. But I'm going to be honest with you. I'm 61 years old. I've told you this many times, how old I am. But in my entire lifetime, it's been about other people, mostly my elders, telling me who my enemy is. Let me just give you a rundown. In my early grades, early grades. I knew who our enemies were because everybody told us, my parents told me, because we had a basement full of food that we would go hide in and our enemies were Cuba and the Soviets. They were the big boogeyman out there and Cuba was their little soldier. And we had stuff in our basement to go hide from the death our enemies might bring to us. And let me tell you, nothing impresses the mind of a first or second grader than that story contextually in your life, okay? And um, never mind that one of my best friends now in the whole world is the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Cuba. And we, and our Presbytery has, is developing a relationship with the Presbyterian Church in Cuba. And, they're per and these are people perfectly fine being Cubans, by the way. <laughs> they're not looking to come here. They're perfectly fine being Cubans, I know, which for some is a terrible thing to say. They were my first enemies as a kid. As I got older, the, my elders told me that the Vietnamese were my enemies. And I was going into high school now and I was worrying about the fact that I was coming of age and might have to go over there. And the Vietnamese were my enemies, but only the ones in the north. So you had to kind of split the race up and choose north and south, and south were not, but north were because of ideology. That war was over, 
And then our enemies, I remember this so well, were Central American dictators that we couldn't control. They were our enemies. Then, of course, comes bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and then somehow Saddam Hussein got in the mix, and now he was an enemy. And my, I, even as an adult, I couldn't wrap my mind around that, and um, said so in a sermon in Palm Coast, and a bunch of people left the church over that. And now, some just declare Muslims. Muslims in general to be our enemies. Regardless, we hear that rhetoric all the time coming out of Christian churches for crying out loud. And to be honest with you, having lived a life of being told who my enemy was by my elders and being expected to walk in lockstep, I can be honest to you today and say, I can't wrap my head around the idea of having an enemy. To tell you the truth, I don't think in my life I've ever had anybody I can say with definite conviction that this is my enemy. That this is that that people who believe in a certain ideology are somehow my enemy. I, I can't say it. I've never been able to say that I've ever had an enemy. I got jumped one time when I was in junior high school in Long Beach, California by two grown guys and a knife and I, and I didn't have time to think about them being my enemy. I just ran like the blazes to get out of there. And I'm not sure, that I can't even say they were my enemy. They were guys I had to get away from. So I don't know. But the other thing, however, is this. I realize that my saying that I can never think of a time in my life when I've had an enemy is at least partly my white privilege speaking. I have never been of a race that was, that was put into forced slavery or forced servitude or forced economic oppression. And I suppose if I was part of such a race, I might think of those people who are oppressing me as being my enemy. And so I don't understand their context or their struggle. But just because I don't understand them and they don't understand me, I still can't see them as my enemy. You know, I'm wondering how many Jews in Palestine considered the Romans their enemies. And I, I'm, I'm supposing there were a lot. Yet at the same time, Here's a Jesus who actually reaches out to Roman soldiers and makes a difference like he does with anybody else. And he says, in that context, in that context of severe oppression, he says, love your enemies and pray for your persecutors. What if Jesus said that in certain political rallies in America today? He wouldn't get out in one piece. People who say they really love Jesus wouldn't even recognize Jesus standing in their midst. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's a significant statement in the sense that it means we do understand our neighbors like ourselves. But how in the world can you love the so-called enemy? who is nothing like you and who your elders told you, watch out for these people. And it goes generation to generation to generation. Back in 1979, one of my seminary friends was actually a doctoral student at Princeton's Theological Seminary, but for some reason he hung out with three or four of us. His name was Charles Amjad Ali, and he was from Pakistan. And back in 1979, we didn't have any problem with Pakistanis, by the way, back then. But, um, but Charles was a great guy. We hung out with him a lot. 
And one day he had to go to the Princeton University Library and do some studying, and it was kind of late at night, and he was walking back across campus, and he had to walk past the uh, Princeton University pub, which was the undergraduate pub, and it was pretty loud and raucous at times. And he was walking by the university pub, and this is in the time of the Iranian hostage crisis. And he's walking by the university pub. And these three guys come out of the pub and they're snockered. And they see him. And they run up to him and they get in his face and they said, you dirty Iranian, we are going to rough you up. And Charles, like, he said he was terrified. And he started screaming, I'm not Iranian, I'm not Iranian, I'm a Pakistani. And these three guys goes, oh, you're Pakistani. Oh, you're our friend. These guys didn't know an enemy from a hole in the ground. They just made assumptions about human beings, what human beings and who human beings were. I think Jesus makes it pretty clear that it is work to love our neighbors by seeking to understand them the way we understand ourselves, then he expects the same when it comes to thinking about enemies. It's in the gospel, friends. You can't eliminate one and accept the other. They both have equal rate weight coming from the mouth of Christ. It means that we all really have a lot of work to do. And who is my enemy is the obvious question. But the next obvious question is, why is that person? Why is that race? Why is that ethnicity? Why is that nationality my enemy? And sometimes I'm wondering if it's people in power who are more our enemy than the ones they're telling us to hate. When I ask that question of myself, I know that deep down that there are nasty and dangerous people out there. I know that. But I have to be honest and say, I just don't know what an enemy is. Because in my heart, in my mind, in my soul, I've never had one. And I think Jesus is okay with that. Amen. Let us stand and say what we believe.